Uh, now, this is the first time I'm doing the Q&A service with these two numbskulls who um, my wife gave birth to. Um, and I had a small role in it. But, um, but uh, anyway, these are my two sons, if you don't know. They both serve on staff here at Cornerstone as pastors. Uh, this is uh, at the far end, our, our oldest son, Tyler. And then uh, Austin, the middle child who has the middle seat right here. And the middle child is always a little challenging in every family. But uh, anyway, um, and the older child always likes to tell the younger kids what to do <laughs> yeah, growing up. So this is, a, this is a joy for me to be able to be here with, with uh, my two sons. We'll see how it goes. Maybe you guys won't be back next year. Um, Maybe you won't be back next year. <laughs> well, <laughs> you keep this up. Uh, keep this up. Uh huh. All right. You're fired. Go home. Um, and so anyway, we're going we're gonna to do the best we can to answer some of these questions. And I'm going to take um, the first couple and, uh, and let's pray first and then we'll, we'll dive into these. We, we're, we have a lot of questions that people are texting in. Lord, this is your day. We just thank you for your, your grace. And um, we ask, Lord, for you to just guide us in all of these questions and answers. We want this to be pleasing to you. And we want it to be edifying to the body of Christ today. We thank you for a new year. We just pray you go before us. Bless this year, Lord, the good of it and the bad of it. And continue to just glorify yourself. Uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you for your, your many kindnesses to us as a church, as uh, just as individuals, as families. Uh, we just uh, commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Dad, right. before you start, All right, before real quickly, uh -huh. just want to take a moment to appreciate him. So 2021, and he doesn't know I'm saying this, but 2021 marks 30 years that you started Cornerstone. 1991, 30 years. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I don't know where 30 years have gone, but uh, you weren't even a thought. Now, Tyler was just... Barely one. Just a lad. Just a young lad. I remember it all. But yeah. <laughs> you do? Yeah. It's amazing. That's amazing, yeah. Um, yeah, so 30 years ago, first, first Sunday of 1991. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. All right. Um, now that that's out of the way. Okay, so right out of the gate. So we've been getting this question, and this, this is not specifically a Bible question, but you're wanting to know... Um, you know, a biblical approach or a, a pastoral position on something. And so many of you have been asking, you know, what is the church's position on getting a COVID vac vaccination? And, but the part of this question is where cells involved are from abortions. Uh, I have to be honest with you. I didn't, I had to look this up um, this morning when I, when I saw the question starting to come in. There's, there's some debate ab about that part, about the cells involved from abortions, the best I could tell in a, in a quick overview is that um, some cells from aborted fetuses a few decades ago were used in the testing of uh, Pfizer, and both Pfizer and Moderna did that in, in the testing of the initial stages of the vaccination, but there are no fetal tissue or cells used in the manufacturing of it. So it's not like you're going to get injected with uh, fetal cells. But you know what? To be honest, it's so difficult these days to know what sources to trust. And so I, I don't want to you know, say anything definitive about the use of these cells because in my quick review of it in just a few minutes before the service, you know, I saw some conflicting things, and I don't honestly know what to believe about it. Here, here's, here's what it always comes down to. You know, as a believer, you and I have been given what is commonly referred to as a sanctified conscience. There are a lot of things in life that you may not have chapter or verse about in the Bible. Of course, anybody who's been here for any length of time knows that as a church, and me as a pastor, we're very pro-life here. Life matters from the womb to the tomb, an uncompromised positions we've taken on being pro-life. Um, but there are a lot of issues that happen in life where you may not have chapter and verse uh, to give you clear guidance. So what it comes down to is a, you have to exercise your sanctified conscience. 
There are, there are some people who uh, have problems with the COVID vaccine, then don't get it. There are other people who are like, I can't wait till it comes out, then, then get it. Um, it really does come down to some things to a matter of personal conscience. Um, and so um, exercise that, make a personal decision, do your homework. Uh, I need to do more homework myself about it, um, but it really should, it's not, uh, we don't, the church is not gonna have a position about it. Um, but as far as like what is beneficial to you personally, do your homework, make a personal decision about it, and that comes down to your own sanctified conscience. Um, one more question I'll do before I throw it over to you guys. Somebody asked, it seems impossible for Noah to get a pair of every animal on the ark. How can you believe that these stories are true? Aren't they just moral lessons? Um, I, I think it's more than moral lessons. I, I take the Bible literally, um, and there are some allegorical uh, passages of scripture, but otherwise it's a literal book that should be taken literally, read literally, understood literally. Um, Dr. Henry Morris wrote a book years ago uh, called, I think it was called In the Beginning, and it's a commentary in the first 10 chapters of the book of Genesis. And uh, he determined that um, based on the best scientific uh, analysis that there were probably around 18,000 species back in the days of the ark of, of mammals and amphibians and reptiles. And um, 18,000 um, species of animals, uh, the average size of which was a sheep. And so you could get 36, then if you took a pair of 18,000, every species, you could get 36,000 animals on one third of the ark. So it's, it's not um, far-fetched. It, uh, I don't think these are fables um, at all. This is, this is true and it's history and it's uh, God's documented uh, record of his involvement uh, in not just creation, but in mankind and the ultimate involvement is to redeem us from our sins. All right, who wants to take one over here? I can take one. But um, I mean, another reason you should know that question is because I thought you were there that day. That's two. I'm going to take note, right? That's two. All right. All right. So I'll take a question that came in. Uh, is there any mention in Roman history of Jesus's resurrection? And I love this question. Um, we have specifically, I'm just going to list three quick Roman resources that specifically talk about Jesus and Christianity. They don't necessarily specify or speak about Jesus' resurrection in full, but Suetonius, he was a Roman bi biographer of the day, uh, first, second century AD. Tacitus was a Roman historian that speaks specifically about Jesus and his followers. And then Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger was a Roman governor in the Roman province of Bithynia and speaks about Jesus as well. But I'm actually gonna direct you to uh, some sources here and I'm gonna list off a couple. If you don't catch them all, you can, this will be posted tomorrow. You can go back, rewind, pause it here. Um, but some, some men in the faith who have done just some obviously more uh, research than I have on this subject, experts in their field. Uh, a great book is The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was an atheist who was a, a, a journalist for the Chicago Tribune, I think in the 70s. Uh, and his wife was a believer. She, he went out, there's, a mo there's been a motion picture movie done on this uh, book that he wrote called The Case for Christ. He went out to disprove his wife's faith, his wife's Christianity, actually ended up uh, going from an atheist to a believer in Jesus because the evidence was uh, just so overwhelming. So The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, he details the research and the evidence that he um, went through um, a, a great essay, essay by Aaron Brake called The Facts of the Resurrection. I love William Lane Craig as well. Um, great apologist, William Lane Craig. He has a video, you can just Google it uh, on YouTube. Uh, what do scholars believe about the resurrection? Uh, also another website I love is by Stephen Bancars. It's called reasonsforjesus.com, reasonsforjesus.com. Um, goes into a lot of detail, but I'm gonna just quickly name two of the um, of the, the, the details that some of those scholars talk about. And number one is the empty tomb. The empty tomb being um, such valuable evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, it, obviously an empty tomb, you could say, well, they could have stole the body. And that's exactly what uh, Jesus' uh, enemies said back in the day. But the interesting thing about the empty tomb is if you wanted to put 
that claim to bed real quickly that Jesus rose from the dead, you could have simply just gone and tried to find the body or said, no, the, the, the stone is still covering uh, the, the sepulcher, the, the tomb. But they didn't say the disciples are drunk. They didn't say the, the, the tomb still has the body in it. They said someone must have stolen the body. So there is no debate. There is an empty tomb. There is an empty tomb. So something happened to that empty tomb. It's very interesting. There's archaeological and archaeological archaeological discovery um, from the time AD 41. They found they call it the Nazareth inscription. The Nazareth inscription uh, from the time AD 41. The Roman Emperor Claudius wrote an edict uh, to the Roman world because of this the, this Jewish uproar um, about. Uh, this resurrected Jesus. And so it got all the way to the emperor of Rome, Claudius at the time, AD 41, and the Nazareth inscription, it's a, an edict from Claudius that there will be capital punishment to those who remove a body from a tomb. So something happened to the tomb that day. It wasn't, oh, the disciples are drunk, the disciples are crazy, they're hallucinating. It was, no, the tomb is empty and someone must have removed the body. And that's exactly what Matthew says in his gospel, that the Jewish leaders attempted to spread this rumor that someone must have stolen the body, the disciples stole the body to um, further perpetrate this lie that Jesus somehow rose from the dead. So um, the empty tomb, and then number two, the blood of the martyrs. The blood of the martyrs. I mean, millions upon millions of believers have died for the faith. Um, specifically, many of the apostles of Jesus Christ. I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, if someone, you know, Peter was, uh, Jewish history tells us that Peter was crucified upside down. Uh, he didn't want to be associated with uh, Jesus being crucified right side up, but uh, Peter died for the faith. James died for the faith. Um, Paul beheaded for the faith. Um, if I'm put in that situation, you can, you can, I'd be quick to tell the truth. I don't think that many people would die for a lie. So the blood of the martyrs, uh, those are just two quick things. Again, uh, research some of those sources that I mentioned. They go into greater detail than I did in the quick two minutes that I gave. But really good question. And we celebrate a risen Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. What you got down there at the end of the row, Tyler? All right. Um, so someone submitted a question texting. And this person says they're the first time studying the Bible but they refer to Pastor Gary and saying that um, you said that Abraham was the first Jew, then how did he know who the Jews were that needed to be rescued? So simply put, um, Abraham was not the first Jew. Um, he was a Gentile and his name was originally Abram. And in Genesis chapter 12, it happens after Genesis 11, which is the Tower of Babel scene. And if, if you do your homework in the timeline, scholars believe that it was a roughly 200 years after the Tower of Babel that God plucked Abraham, or f Abram first, from Mesopotamia and wanted to start a new people, a nation through him. Um, so thus his son Isaac, and from there Jacob, and then you got the 12 tribes of Israel, would have been the, the first Jewish people, the nation of Israel coming from that, but Abraham himself was a Gentile. There was no Israel in the first 11 chapters, first 12 chapters of Genesis. There was no Jewish people. There was no Jewish race. Um, and so Abraham, we have to remember that he was not a, a Jew. He's the father of the Jewish nation. He's the father of the, the Hebrew people, but he himself was a Gentile and God used him um, for his glory and for his purposes to begin a nation through this one man. And uh, it's just an amazing miracle how God birthed a nation through this, this man and how he told him if um, your nation will be blessed and those that bless you will be blessed and those that curse you will be cursed. And that is the same for us today. Um, those that bless Israel will be blessed and those that curse Israel will be cursed. So God keeps his promises and he's still the God um, of Israel. And Israel was, was to be the, the vocal, the spokesperson for everyone. Um, to know who Jesus is. And so, um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, yeah it, um, you know, technically Abraham was a Gentile. It was, there, was, there were no Jewish people. The Jewish race came from his seed um, and, and the Jews today see him as the father of their faith. 
Um, but he technically was a Gentile, and the Jewish race came from his seed. Okay, a um, couple questions here. What does Cornerstone believe about the Catholic Church being built upon Peter and it being the one true faith as Catholics believe? We have a lot of people who have left the Roman Catholic Church and are attending here at Cornerstone. I, I don't have any uh, hard statistics on it, but I, my guess is about a third of our congregation is made up of those who have Catholic backgrounds. Um, the, the question really arises out of Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus takes his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi and he says, who do men say that I am? And they offer these different opinions about the word on the street. Some say you're Jeremiah, some say Elijah, some say another prophet of old. And Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he makes this profession of faith that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. Jesus then says to him, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, you're not smart enough to got, have gotten that on your own. <laughs> my Father revealed this to you supernaturally. And then Jesus goes on to say in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it or will not prevail against it. Roman Catholic tradition takes that statement and says, Jesus founded the church on Peter. When you look at the Greek language of the original language of the New Testament, it, it's not possible that that's what Jesus meant, and here's why. When Jesus said, you are Peter, the Greek word is petros, and it means pebble. He says, you are Peter, and upon this rock, and the, and the word there is Petra, I will build my church. And Petra means boulder, something uh, much larger than a pebble. And what is significant about the language is that when Jesus says, you are Peter, Petros is masculine, and upon this rock, Petra is feminine, I will build my church. Anybody who knows ancient languages knows that you cannot have a feminine word that modifies a masculine word. It, it, in other words, Petra does not modify Peter. Peter does not modify Petra. There are two distinct things there. So he's not saying upon Peter I will build this church. He's saying upon a much larger rock, boulder, I will build this, uh, my church. And what he's referring to is the confession or the profession of faith that Peter uttered. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church of Jesus Christ is founded upon the profession of believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, not a man, not Peter. You know, if, if the church of Jesus Christ is built upon a human being, we're in big trouble. It is built on the profession of faith that Peter uttered, but not on Peter himself. Then one other quick question, um, somebody asked, can you clarify when we receive our glorified bodies? And so it is true that as Christians, we will receive a glorified body, meaning a body similar to the one that Jesus had. After he rose from the dead, his body was imperishable, um, and it was a glorified body. So he still had physical attributes, but, he, but it was an imperishable body that, that would not die again or would not um, become frail or sick. Um, and so we get a similar body. Now, Paul will write in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, he says, uh, or 51, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible or imperishable, and we shall be changed. So here's the deal. If you know Christ as your Savior and you were to die today, your spirit separates from your body and your spirit goes to be with the Lord in heaven. Your body goes into the ground and will decompose. Um, but when your spirit goes to be with the Lord, you don't have a glorified body. It's just your spirit. So when do we get a glorified body? Well, that's what Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 15. There's going to be a moment when Christ returns for the church and a trumpet blast is sounded. And when the trumpet blast is sounded, the people who are still alive, the generation of, of, of believers who are alive at the time of the Lord's second coming, only in the clouds when he blows the trumpet, 
will get their glorified bodies on the way up to heaven. Because that's why uh, Paul writes there that we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So in a split second, in the twinkling of an eye, believers who are currently on the earth when Christ returns in the clouds will get a glorified body on the way up. But he also says there, the dead shall be raised imperishable. So those who have already gone on to be with the Lord before his second coming, they don't have a glorified body yet. But at the sound of the trumpet, the graves will open up and those uh, glorified bodies will be risen up and reunited with the spirits that are presently with the Lord in heaven. So there will be some kind of a union of a, of a, of a uh, perishable body that is raised imperishable, glorified, and there's this reunion with the spirit of the individual who is in heaven, so that then everybody at that time has a glorified body. Now, there's another time that people get a glorified body, those who died during the millennial period, but that's, that's for another Bible study. But um, right now, if you were to die, you don't get a glorified body until the second coming of Christ. Your spirit goes to be with the Lord, but, you, you, but the body is something different. And it is raised imperishable at, at the last trumpet. So that's, that's when we get a glorified body. I'll All take right. a, a question that kind of is similar. It piggybacks off of that. So someone asks, does scripture indicate that a person can only be saved during their time on earth? Is there any biblical evidence that suggests that one cannot be saved following the death of their worldly body? And they also ask, what about unborn children, toddlers, and the cognitively disabled? So yeah, this is it. Um, one chance, one shot, one lifetime. Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9.27, just as people are destined to die once and after that, not you get a second chance, another moment, but after death comes the judgment. Um, that's what the writer of Hebrews says. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if you're a believer, as dad previously mentioned, if you're a believer, when your spirit leaves your body, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. I've heard a lot of conversation around this topic about soul sleep. You just go to the ground and you, you sleep until Christ comes back. To be absent from the body, Paul says, is to be present with the Lord. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we need to take our time here on earth seriously. Um, this is by God's grace that we have an opportunity here on earth to come to accept Christ. But um, after this time on earth, you bought, your body goes into the ground, then comes the judgment, and um, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to Christ? Um, and if you haven't, there's punishment, and if you have, there's eternal life with Christ. Um, and then to finish this question, what about unborn children, toddlers, and the cognitively disabled? Uh, scripture doesn't specifically, directly answer that question, but we see a, a, a passage in Scripture um, where David, many of you know the story where David has a, an affair with Bathsheba and they have a child together, but as consequence of that affair, um, the child dies. And David mourns and prays to the Lord and cries out to the Lord, Lord, please preserve the life of this child. Um, and the Lord basically gives him a no because of uh, the sin that David committed. And then when uh, David is done mourning after the child's death. Uh, people come to him and say, why are, you, why are you not still mourning? And he says, my child will not come to be with me, but I know that I will go to be with my child. And so it implies, you know, there in scripture that um, the unborn, uh, those who are not cognitively able to make a decision for Christ, maybe because of some disability, um, it implies there that God's grace covers that and God's grace covers them because those we see in Scripture, those who are punished um, for their sin, those who are punished and experience God's wrath are those who outright reject the Lord. They are able to cognitively make that decision to reject God, reject Jesus Christ, reject the gospel. And I don't believe that children, obviously, and those who uh, don't have the cognitive capability, I don't believe that, that um, they're able to outright you know, reject the Lord and, and cognitively make that decision. So I, I believe in, from that story with David's child, I believe that God's grace covers, covers them. Yeah. Tyler? Awesome. I have an end times question. Um, this question says, do you envision the new Babylon as being figurative or literal? 
And so what they mean by New Babylon is Mystery Babylon, and it's referenced in Revelation 17 and 18. Um, and people have speculated this, Mystery Babylon of, you know, it, is it literal, is it figurative? Um, for those that take the figurative side, they've thought that it could perhaps be Rome, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, New York City, or even America itself as this mystery Babylon. Um, B Babylon, the city, is mentioned second um, most all-time cities mentioned in the Bible only to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's number one, Babylon number two. And there's two prophecies, Isaiah chapter 13 and Jeremiah 50, that talk about the final destruction of Babylon. Um, and this hasn't happened, literally, in all of history. Babylon has never been utterly destroyed. It was, it was really a slow death, and it actually remained in some form until about 1000 AD. So Jeremiah and Isaiah's prophecies, um, if they're to be taken literal, has not even happened yet. Um, it has not come to utter destruction. It's just been a slow death. Now, if you remember in the 1980s, Saddam Hussein attempted to revive and bring back Babylon, and he himself believed he was like the next Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar 2.0 if you will, and he, it failed, it didn't work, but he, he tried it. And I do believe, um, my opinion, and we here at, at Cornerstone, um, if, if we're gonna take the prophecies to be literally fulfilled, then I believe a, a literal Babylon must be brought back to life only to be destroyed at the end of the tribulation. Um, Revelation, again, 17 and 18 talk about this, and I, I think it'll be a, the literal Babylon that's in Iraq right now to be revived. The mystery part, it's very interesting, why is it called a mystery then? I think it just may indicate that there's gonna be something new that hasn't happened before um, with, this, with this Babylon. Um, one of the new things will be that the Antichrist, in Revelation, it tells us that he will control the world's economy by the mark, the mark of the beast, and Babylon will be the capital of commerce in the end times. And I, I, don't, I personally don't believe it'll be figurative. I think that this will be a literal, um, rebirth of Babylon in Iraq right now. And, and if you see Iraq now, in the past 20 years, on, on headlines now, never before was, was Iraq really mentioned. Now you see things in the Middle East really coming to life. And we're talking about the Middle East all the time now in our news. And I think, personally, if, if God brings back the nation of Israel, which was a barren, dead wasteland, and God brought it back to life, then I think God can bring back Babylon, and he's going to use it as his vessel for the end times during the judgment time. And so, um, is it literal or figurative? We honestly don't know, but I think the Bible um, leans heavily, I think, toward a literal Babylon in Iraq to be resurrected once again, and the Antichrist will use it as his headquarters for, for part of the time. Yeah, I think so too. Keep your eye on Babylon. It's about 50 miles south of Baghdad, and I think it's going to be revived again. Okay, I've gotten several questions about elders. Uh, one person asked, uh, 1 Timothy 5 mentions the elders who direct the affairs of the church. Does Cornerstone have elders? We do. Uh, we have eight elders who help to direct the affairs of the church, which are different from pastoral elders. Every um, pastor is an elder. Not every elder is a pastor. There are some elders we have in our congregation who are uh, not called to be pastors, but who still qualify as elders based on 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1, who help direct the affairs of the church primarily in relation to the financial end of things, um, the accountability of the finances, and um, matters of building and acquisition and that kind of thing. But then along that line, uh, a couple of people have asked, um, why doesn't Cornerstone have members? How do the elders know who they are responsible for shepherding if they don't know who is part of the flock? How can you implement church discipline if you don't have members? And it is true, we don't have an official membership roster here at Cornerstone. I'm more concerned about you being a member of the body of Christ and going to heaven than to have your name on a list as a, quote, member of Cornerstone Chapel. It's more important that we know that you are a part of the family of God. That's the more important membership. You know, I grew up in a mainline church um, where membership um, was only as good as someone decided to stay at a church. And as soon as they decided they didn't like the way the pastor was, they left and the membership really meant nothing. How do the elders at a church our size keep track of what is going on and potentially have to exercise church discipline? We do have to exercise church discipline from time to time. Um, but that doesn't really have anything to do with membership. That has to do with knowing your flock 
And, and I'll be honest, uh, uh, in a large church, it is harder to do that. But what usually happens is, to the, to the degree that it rises um, to the attention of in small group leaders, we have, we have koinonia groups, it comes to our attention. Uh, the way that, you know, we have 14 full-time pastors on staff, the way that they are integrated in the life of the church, they find out, you know, you'll be surprised how a network of a communication happens in a church. And, um, and so we will learn of situations that have to sometimes be addressed and church discipline does have to sometimes be exercised. But that is exercised whether or not there's membership or not. That's based on something you're doing needs to be corrected. And if it is not going to be corrected because it's a violation, an overt violation of scripture, then you're going to be asked to leave the church. There is such a thing as church discipline. It's a very fine line, though, because we want the Holy Spirit to work in people's hearts, too. And, and so we're not going to just, you know, be uh, examining everybody's life and then begin to say, you need to leave because your life isn't right in this way or in that way. We want people to come who have no knowledge of what is right and what is wrong and to have a chance for the Holy Spirit to begin to move and redirect their lives. So we have to monitor it very carefully as elders and pastors to make sure that we are allowing room for the Holy Spirit to work, but at the same time, uh, keeping a careful watch on the flock to make sure that there's not something that is detrimental to the body um, because there are those who um, are comfortable in, in their sin and they know it's wrong and they continue to do it and they continue to prey on other people. And so it, it is a difficult thing to monitor, but it doesn't have anything to do with church membership. Membership is, is typically only as good as what the member wants it to be. And the moment they don't like something, they'll leave anyway. So it's not binding. And so in that sense, we have to just make a careful examination of the flock in general and do the best we can to address issues that need to be addressed. The beautiful thing about, and I, don't, and I don't say this to just skirt the issue at all, but I sincerely say this as uh, glory unto the Lord. The beautiful thing about going straight through the Bible, which is what we do here, when, when, when a church teaches the Word of God, the Word of God does its surgical work in the hearts and lives of people. And what will typically happen that I've noticed over now 30 years here at Cornerstone is when God's word goes forth, it convicts and people either then change or because of the conviction and they don't want to change, they leave. We've had to do very little personal confrontation because God's word goes forth and it does the confronting work on its own and the power in the word of God does his good surgical work in the lives of people. And so we don't have to go around doing too much of that, to be honest with you. People either change because of conviction or they leave because of conviction, and the Holy Spirit uh, typically takes care of that. All right, we've already gone over time, so what I want to do is real rapid fire. If you see some questions that have like uh, a 10 second answer, let's do that real quickly, and then we'll, we'll pray. All right, I'll take a quick one. The Bible refers to James and Jude, James and Jude as brothers of Jesus. Were they actual brothers or is this a reference to them as apostles of Jesus? Yes, they were actual brothers. They were half brothers. Same mom, different dad, obviously. Um, That's good. Next. Okay. All right. Go. But, 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 but. This is rapid fire. We got to uh, go. Um, how many times in biblical history before the resurrection did Jesus manifest himself as a Christophany? Uh, Exodus 3, Genesis 14, and you have the book of Joshua, where he's the commander of the army, and also Gideon. So there's four right there. Is Jesus' real name Yeshua? Yeah, I mean, Jesus is a Greek tra transliteration of his Hebrew given name, which was Yahashua, the Lord of salvation, often abbreviated as Yeshua. So that, w that was his original Hebrew name. Next. Are Christians the body of Christ or the bride of Christ? You've used both those terms as synonymous. Are they synonymous? Yes, they're synonymous in the sense that they both describe the collective uh, body of believers. Um, watch Before the Wrath. I think the ladies watched it at one of their gatherings. Before the Wrath with Kevin Sorbo, the old Hercules guy. Nice. What a hunk. Okay. Um, okay. But yes, body that's, of Christ, that's three. bride of Christ. Both, both talk about believers in Jesus. All right. You, you want to do one? Quick. Wow. What version of the Bible do you use for your teachings? I, I use New King James now. I switched it a couple years ago because the NIV went out of print and I don't like the revised uh, uh, NIV, so I went to New King James. Yes? Must I do all this? Well, 
We'll leave you the easy I've asked part. Jesus to, yeah, I've asked Jesus to come into my heart and become my Savior privately. I did not stand up or come to the front of the church when invited by Pastor Gary. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. You can, you can make a personal decision for Christ without having to come forward. I sometimes ask people to come forward as I do it uh, often, well, as I did this past Christmas. Um, because I believe that the, the call to follow Christ is a public decision. And so I don't want people to, um, to be ashamed about that. And so it helps stretch you by coming forward and making a public decision for Christ. But you, you can, uh, I didn't walk forward in the church when I came to know Christ. I was at a youth camp um, when I was a teenager. So you can make that decision without actually having to walk forward. Anyone else? One last one. Um, this one's from an eight-year-old son. When we pray, why do we, why do we have to put our hands uh, together? <laughs> I've always learned that it, because it helps you concentrate and not pick your nose. So. All right, you guys are not And is it this way or is it this way? <laughs> well, what's, and what's the old, you know, here's the church, here's the here's steeple. Here's the steeple, open the door, seal all the people. people. Yeah. Yeah. You, don't have to, you don't have to clasp your hands when you, when you pray. Um, we can you, take different It does postures. help me focus. Yeah. Are you, do you have one other? <laughs> it's not serious, though. I can oh, tell by your look. No, it, it is. How can we plant more Calvary chapels? There are no Calvary chapels in Montgomery County, Maryland. Yeah. Montgomery County, Maryland is not that far. They can drive here. <laughs> But, amen, somebody drives for, how far do you drive? Gaithersburg. Gaithersburg, see? Yeah, brother. But, you know, listen, if you have a desire to plant a church, you know, in Montgomery County, let us know. We'll, we'll see what we can do. You're now thinking I should, never should have texted Maybe you guys can go to Montgomery County <laughs> after those answers. All right. I'll let's, still drive. Yeah, you'll still drive. Can you drive yet? <laughs> All right. This has been fun. Thank you for your questions. Now, listen, we, we have a lot of questions. Some of your questions might get answered in the next service or the one after. Um, so when we splice all this together for the archives on the teaching library, we will put all three services together with uh, all, as many questions as we can get to. But thank you for your questions. Let's pray. So I'm going to um, address a question. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. We probably got a dozen questions on this, and I don't know if there was just like a, a run at cemeteries about cremation, I, but we've gotten like a dozen questions about cremation, and is, is it okay uh, for Christians to be uh, cremated? Um, and in, in Genesis 3.19, it tells us that from dust you were created, and to dust you shall return. Um, there... Cremation just speeds up the process. <laughs> there's, really, there's really no difference. Um, cremation it takes about two to two and a half hours at about 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, natural decomposition takes a couple of decades. So it's a couple of hours or a couple of decades. You're going back to dust either way. But there's nothing, some people think, well, there's you know, something sacrilegious about it. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, the book of 1 Samuel ends by telling us that after King Saul had been captured by the Philistines, he and his sons, that they hung Saul's body uh, on, on the walls of Beit Shan, and that the, the Hebrew men from Jabesh Gilead came in the night and, uh, and took down the bodies of Saul and, and his sons. Um, and, you know, the Philistines were doing it to disgrace their bodies, about hanging them on a wall, you know, the city wall to disgrace them. But the men of Jabesh Gilead came and retrieved the bodies of Saul and his sons. And then it tells us that then they burned Saul's body. So you see that they cremated him at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 31. Um, it, there's nothing um, wrong with it. It becomes a personal conviction, a personal choice. But we were uh, created from dust and to dust we shall return. Uh, an, another uh, question I'll take real quickly and then I'll toss it over to you guys. Um, and you know, we don't, we don't avoid the hard questions. So I get this every year. Why don't we have a woman pastor in our church? And so, you know, I don't usually uh, skate around controversial things. So why should I with this one either? Um, y you know what the reality, and it is true that we don't have women pastors. We don't have uh, women elders. Um, and the short answer, but I'll give an explanation, is because, you know, the Bible is, is our handbook here for faith and practice. And um, uh, the problem that we have right now in our culture is that the differences between men and women are trying to be erased. 
And we're trying to go with a gender neutral culture, which denies the uniqueness of both genders. When we try to just, you know, blend it all together and, and, uh, and deny the differences. Uh, Dr. Michelle Cretella, who is the head of the American College of Pediatricians, uh, she was on an, an, a radio interview with uh, Family Research Council um, a couple of years ago. And she, from a medical standpoint, made the comment that there are more than 6,500 genetic differences between men and women. We accept the physical differences, but we need to also recognize spiritual differences in this sense, that we are all, as men and women, equal in God's eyes. There's no question about that. Our worth and value is absolutely the same not just between genders, but between all races, all people. In Galatians chapter 3, 28, Paul said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ. The Bible makes it clear that we are equal in importance, but we are different in performance. What do I mean? God has assigned some responsibilities to men, some responsibilities to women. And just like biologically, nobody's gonna argue with the fact that women were selected as the ones to give birth physically, biologically. There are some things that God says spiritually, I've reserved for a man. And one of those things is spiritual leadership, spiritual leadership in the church and in the home. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 12, uh, Paul spells out how he doesn't permit in this instant uh, when he speaks about spiritual leadership, he talks about how he doesn't um, permit women to teach or have authority over men in the church. That isn't an antiquated thing. That is just recognizing that we're all equal in importance, different in performance, and God has assigned different tasks and responsibilities. Now, I know this is different from the way a lot of churches function, um, but when I'm asked the question, I wanna give you the straight answer um, that the Bible gives the guidelines in, in respect to certain roles and certain responsibilities. And when it comes to laying down doctrine and spiritual leadership in the church, this is what God has designed in, in the handbook. And we just don't mess with the handbook. The culture changes, right? Culture, you know, evolves and they start to embrace things or, or they start to, you know, value things differently perhaps. But, you know, the Word of God is constant and it is unchanging because truth is unchanging. And that doesn't mean it's out of date or it's antiquated. It just means that when culture goes and veers in a certain direction, whatever the subject might be, not, not necessarily on this subject in particular, but when culture goes a certain direction, the one thing that is the anchor for our souls is the truth of God's Word. And so we always defer to the Bible and say, okay, it may not be popular in the culture. It may not be, you know, what a lot of people or majority of people think or do in regard to whatever the subject matter is, but the Bible remains our constant handbook for life and faith and practice. And so... That's the way it is here. We do have women on staff. We have women on Find staff. We have, we have women in, in different uh, managerial roles, uh, for sure. Um, but when it comes to pastors and elders, we don't. That's a good point. Um, I'll take a question. I'll do my best to keep it brief. What is your view on the Apocrypha? Uh, so the Apocrypha was written between the years 200 BC, 400 AD, I believe. Um, they are books that you will not find in our Protestant Bibles, books, though, that will be found in the Catholic Bible at the end of the Old Testament. Um, I don't believe that these were inspired books. Uh, the Apocrypha endorses many doctrines that are just simply incompatible with Scripture. I'll name three. Giving money to atone for sins. We don't find that in Scripture. Number two, praying for the dead and giving money to atone for their sins. We don't see that in Scripture as well. And then number three, praying to saints in heaven and asking them for prayer. We don't see that in Scripture as well. Um, doctrines taught in the Apocrypha that are incompatible with Scripture. Um, the Apocryphal books weren't thought of as inspired even by the authors who wrote the Apocrypha. Um, Paul doesn't quote the Apocrypha. None of Jesus' disciples quote the Apocrypha. Uh, Jesus never refers to the Apocrypha. So, um, in short, I don't believe they were inspired books. Um, many people from the early church saw them as um, having some good moral lessons and value, and that may be true, but inspired, no. So I think we need to tread very cautiously with the Apocrypha. Uh, we had a lot of end times questions come in, so 
I'm going to tackle this one. Where is the United States in end times prophecy? <laughs> Here we go. So the two United minutes. States. Two what? minutes. See if you can get this in two minutes. Go I ahead. can do it. <laughs> America is never specifically mentioned in, in Scripture anywhere. And if, if you found it, tell me. Um, but in regard to the end times, the only nation that the Bible seems to be concerned with specifically is Israel. Now, in Revelation, the, the only nations or cities or uh, countries that are mentioned in Revelation are only Israel and Babylon. Um, Ezekiel 38, they're going to mention more nations, North Africa, Middle East, and parts of Europe. Um, there may be a small reference to America in Ezekiel 38:13. It's very small, very minor. It's only found in the King James and New King James Version where it talks about America as young lions. Um, but again, it's very up in the air. We, we honestly can't point the finger that that's America definitively. Here's four scenarios that I think of why um, or where the United States is going to end up in end times prophecy. Um, because we don't see it really in Scripture as a, um, a big nation that's a part of the end times, I think that there's four scenarios that perhaps the United States does not play an important role in the end times at all. Something happens. America maybe declines from within, and we're just no longer a superpower anymore. Number two, since the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation, we believe Scripture is clear, perhaps America is not going to be so powerful once the church is taken out. If you think about the rapture happening right before the tribulation, America is no longer, the church is gone, America is no longer its powerful uh, country anymore. A third one is perhaps the United States does not exist anymore once the end times begin. Again, it kind of goes hand in with number one. Um, and number four, perhaps the United States is included with all the other nations that God rejects in the end times. And God does reject a few nations in Revelation chapters 10, 11, 12, 14, and 15, and so on. He will reject certain nations. Maybe America is part of that, that God judges. Um, you know, I, I heard one time Billy Graham gave an awesome quote. He said, if, if God does not judge America, then he has to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Hmm. We, our, our nation... Um, founded over 200 years ago, almost, not even, almost 300 years now. Um, and the sins that we've committed, um, you know, what does God think of us now? Are we, are we really a Christian nation anymore? So, United States of America, we're one of the biggest supporters of Israel as in the, in the world today, but this might not be the case anymore, um, you know, down the road. And so, I personally don't think that USA will, will play a major role in the end times because scripture does not mention it. Um, the biggest nation that God is keeping his eye on is Israel. And so I pray that we support Israel as, as, long, as, we, as long as we do. Um, and those that bless Israel are blessed. Those that curse Israel are cursed. Um, but there is no definitive answer in scripture per se. But just keep your eye on the news. We'll see what happens. Um. I've gotten several questions here um, concerning worship music from Bethel Elevation and Hillsong. What does Cornerstone believe about worship music from Bethel Elevation and Hillsong? And another question very similar to that. Um, for those of you who, who may not be familiar with why some might ask the question, um, there's, I would have some theological problems with some of the doctrine that comes out of Bethel or Elevation or Hillsong churches, as far as um, you know, the teaching goes. Um, but what we try to do here at Cornerstone is you know, examine music. Our, our, our worship uh, leaders are, are very careful in examining music to see if it would stand doctrinally and musically on its own. Now, I understand the argument, and, and this could be a longer answer than it needs to be. Uh, I do understand the argument where some would say, anything associated with Bethel, Elevation, or Hillsong, because they have bad, uh, let me rephrase that, because they have some questionable, um, and I, I would say uh, erroneous theology, not all of it, but just some, that therefore you shouldn't even sing any of the worship music that is produced from those fellowships. We tend to look at it a little bit differently in the sense that we are guarded about the, the um, error of doctrine, um, but if we examine a song for itself to see is it theologically sound, is it doctrinally sound, 
um, then we'll permit it to be sung here, and, and we do. Um, but, you know, there, there are some, is his name Ron Johnson, who's head of? Uh, Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson, who's um, head of, it's is Bethel, right? He, so he yeah. retweeted my election day sermon. Um, you know, I, I don't know the guy, I've never met him. Um, you know, so some people thought that we, you know, were buddies because of that. Like, I, I don't know him, I, we, we've never met. So while I have some concerns doctrinally about some of the things that they teach, if a song by itself is doctrinally sound, we'll sing it. Now, there's, there's other arguments around that. Um, but, you know, sometimes we, um, for example, an old, an old hymn that if you've been around for a while, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, that's a you know, wonderful hymn of our faith. The same controversy existed then when that was written. That was actually a, a tune that was taken from a bar, a pub, and they put Christian music to this bar song. And at the time it was controversial. Now today people sing What a Mighty Fortress is Our God and they really don't have any clue that it was once connected to something that was controversial. So if a song can stand by itself, we'll, we'll, we'll evaluate it for, for what it is and theologically sound, we'll sing it here. But I understand the question and I don't, um, I, I don't have issues with pastors who, who would think differently than what I just said. Um, there is, Tyler, I know you, you read a lot of Michael Heiser's books. There's a question there you might want to get to in a little bit. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions too about communion and baptism. What does your church believe about practicing communion and, and baptism? Do we practice baptism by immersion? We do practice baptism by immersion, which means we, we fully dunk someone. And depending on how much sin I think is in their life, I'll hold them down. Uh, no, no, I, no, I don't. I won't, I won't do that. When I see bubbles, I'll let them up. But um, They nearly killed me. Yeah, well, that's cause. That's exactly right. Um, but um, here's, and we practice, we have been practicing communion generally once a month on Sundays, once a month on Wednesday nights. Since COVID, We've had to table some of this. I mean, you know, who wants to climb into a, you know, a baptismal pool? Um, well, the first person doesn't mind, but everybody else who comes behind them, you know, I don't want to get, get in this water. So that's been difficult for us. And communion, passing the trays and touching elements has been difficult for us too. Yes, Jesus um, was the one who ordained those two practices for the church, communion and baptism. Um, but because they're not salvation issues, um, we're, we're just putting that on hold for a little while till we can get through this pandemic a, a little better. Um, and then, you know, people aren't so uh, concerned about touching the plates and being dunked in the same baptismal. So uh, for now, those things are, are somewhat on hold. Um, but we normally would practice communion once a month on Sundays, once a month on Wednesday nights. And then we, we practice baptisms every month through the summer. Um, and even through the fall, so on a Wednesday night typically, um, but right now it's kind of tabled. All right. I... Uh, this question came in, is it okay for Christians to look toward the heavens for signs of the times? Um, and Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, it does say, then God said, this is the creation story, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. So the Bible does talk about the stars, the moon, the sun, uh, God created them for signs. Now what does it really mean by signs? Well, mainly two things, they're meant uh, to mark time for us and uh, seasons for us, but they're also signs in the sense of navigational indicators. People throughout history have used the stars uh, to navigate their course around the globe. Uh, the danger comes when we look to uh, stars or the heavens um, as signs, particularly uh, with astrology. Um, astrology is a form of divination specifically condemned in scripture. And I know it's super trendy, especially like, I feel like with the, uh, our young adult generation, like I don't know how many times I've heard people say, oh, I'm a Capricorn, I'm a Leo, I'm a Virgo. Um, and we, we really should stay away from astrology. Uh, it is a form of divination condemned in Isaiah, condemned in the book of Daniel um, as well. Um, now, however, we can look to the heavens, we can look to the stars and moons, uh, mainly to um, praise the Lord, to uh, humble ourselves. David says, uh, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're even mindful of them? 
human beings that you care for them. So the stars, uh, anything, I'll put it this way, anything that uh, is created that we have more interest in the creation than the creator, it's, it's dangerous. And that's mm -hmm. what Paul talks about in the book of Romans, that people will begin to worship creation more than they even do the creator. Mm -hmm. And so anything that we look to, I think that the, the stars and look, gazing out in a beautiful night sky is amazing, but it should bring our attention more to the glory of the Lord, focusing on the Lord and not having too much of an unhealthy interest in those things, specifically like astrology and, and astrology teaches that the stars are aligned in such a way that now it, um, it's, it's speaking and, and incorporating itself into our destiny. Okay, that's, that's wrong. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. So we should stay away from that unhealthy interest, but use them as signs to proclaim the goodness of God in our lives. You know, and when, when you were talking there, if I could just piggyback on that a minute, um, you know, about an unhealthy interest in creation. Um, I, I, there was a question somewhere buried in here. I, I, I can't find it now, but some, you know, people will ask me, you know, why does Pastor Gary seem to be cavalier about, you know, the planet and his jokes about recycling and stuff? Um, you know, it's because, look, I know how it turns out. I've read the Bible. This is all going to burn. It's all going to burn. Now, that said, I'm not advocating destroying the planet. I just don't want to elevate planet worship. And we're living in a day when that's what it's become. People are now worshiping creation instead of the creator. It's an inverted problem. And it's under the guise of go green, carbon footprint, recycle, all this stuff, okay? It, it's, it's when, when people start talking about how to save the spotted owl more than how to save an unborn baby, that's twisted. So, so there, there's a warning in Romans about that, about, you know, the, the world is going to start to worship creation more than the creator. So again, I'm not advocating destroy the planet. I, I'm just advocating we don't worship the planet and we can get caught up in all this environmentalism and all of this, save this and save that. And, uh, and it's, it's just, it's, it's, not, it's not right. It's inverting God's design. So, um, and then eventually this planet does burn. You talk about global warming. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn. So don't get too attached to it. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, where we won't have to recycle. I guarantee it. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll take this one. Dad, you mentioned that there was a question that came in with Michael Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm, mm -hmm. and the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Um, has anybody heard of Michael Heiser or this book, The Unseen Realm? Very few. I, I have read this book, and I've read it multiple times. I love it. Um, I'm reading his books, Angels, and another book, Demons, as well, that kind of are taken out of Unseen Realm. Um, but Michael Heiser is a doctor, has a doctorate in Semitic and Hebrew languages, and he's kind of like pretty new on the scene now. Um, but his whole um, study and book is really based on Genesis chapter 1 through 11, so creation to the Tower of Babel and digging deep into like, what, what do we not know about the Unseen Realm? And that's not a scary word to say. We can say that there's an unseen spiritual realm that we can't see but is there. And there are things going on behind the scenes in regards to spiritual beings versus humans. And he just goes into deeper um, dialogue of that. And he's done his research. He'll, he'll cite all his, all his work. Um, you know, I take some things with a grain of salt. Like he's pretty dogmatic with some things. It's like, okay, well, that, I'm, I'm open to it, but let's, let's see what the Bible says. And, but he... He, he is a believer, and um, he's got a podcast called The Naked Bible Podcast. He goes in deeper on different scripture references. Um, but the Deuteronomy 32 worldview is found in his book, The Unseen Realm. And it's, it's based off in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 through 10, um, as like a commentary for the Tower of Babel scene. So if you know the Tower of Babel scene in Genesis 11, it's just a kind of a random uh, passage in there, and then it jumps right to Abraham. Um, and the Deuteronomy 32 worldview is basically when the sons of God in Genesis 6 came down and um, had sexual relations with the women, they produced this giant race, the Nephilim, and then it jumps into the flood. And that scene is just so odd to us. Um, it sounds like science fiction, but it, it's in the Bible. It, it happened. And these sons of God, these angelic beings, came down and, and 
um, created this race of giants called the Nephilim. And the 32 world view is that when God came down to witness the Tower of Babel being set up, it was not a good thing, it was a bad thing. And God came to thwart their plans. And um, basically when he scattered the nations, he allotted the nations to different, um, in a way, angelic beings. And we actually can find this in Daniel's book. The book of Daniel mentions a term, the Prince of Persia. There was a movie about it with Jake Gyllenhaal that has nothing to do with this. <laughs> but the Prince of Persia um, is a reference to a governing spiritual being that governs that land. And I, I personally do believe that there are governing spiritual beings that are, that are not good, that are um, influencing um, different powers, governments, and world leaders. Um, God reigns supremely over all spiritual beings and mankind, amen? He is, he is the Alpha and the Omega and, and the Almighty. Um, but everything with the unseen realm and spiritual things, it just, it does seem odd. But if you look at Hollywood, Hollywood's actually doing an interesting job with that because they're making all these movies that have to do with spiritual beings, unseen realm, d demons, angels. But the, the bad stuff, they try to make it seem good. Um, you know, in, in years ago on ABC Family, which is just garbage, free, it's free form now, it's garbage, don't watch it. Um, they have all these shows about different fallen angels that come and date women, and you've seen Twilight with the vampires, just weird stuff. But they're doing it because it's, it's actually in the Bible and it's, it's something where now America's like gravitated toward. There's something fascinating about the unseen realm. But if you dig too deep in it and, and think everything is good, um, yeah. I mean, it, people it, are intrigued scary. with the supernatural, and the supernatural exists. But so the problem is, if they're not discerning, you don't know what part of the supernatural you're getting, you know. And so there's demonic parts of the supernatural, and there's there's God's part of the supernatural, and so um, people have to be discerning. Uh, we're almost out of time, so let's try to run through some quick questions. Um, somebody asked. Uh, this is a question that probably applies to all of us, I'm sure. How do we know whether God is disciplining us or, or we are going through a trial? Um, that's always a difficult thing to figure out. Sometimes you don't know, is this something I've brought on myself? Um, is this something that God is allowing? Is this something not related to any sin in my life, but it's just, you know, the sinful fallen world in which I live? Um, one of the things I've just always tried to do, since you can't always know which it is, is to always pray and ask the Lord, Lord, what are you trying to teach me in this? Because regardless of whether I've brought it on myself or God's trying to show me something or just because I live in a fallen world, there's something to be learned. And God will use it to teach us and to draw us closer to himself. So it's a good thing just to always pray and say, Lord, what, what are you trying to teach me through this? The other, the other uh, question I wanted to answer real quickly and, um, is, Somebody said, with mental illness such as schizoaffective disorder, am I, according to Scripture, supposed to come off all medication and believe in the Lord to give me a fully sound mind as in before my illness began? And um, listen, I just want to encourage whoever wrote this question and others who might be in similar situations where you're, you're on some kind of prescribed medication, but you're thinking, you know, should I just trust the miracle and not get off the medication? Listen, stay on your medication, okay? Um, there's, there's nothing, even Jesus said in Matthew 9, verse 12, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. It's not like when you become a Christian, you throw out the benefit of doctors and medicine. I mean, God has worked in the medical field to bring about good things for us. Um, and so it should be something that you are, you know, always discussing with your doctor but don't think that you're less spiritual because you're on medication for something that you might need medication for. Listen, if you're a type one diabetic, you need insulin, and if you stop taking your insulin, you will die, and don't look at it as, well, then I'm not really trusting the Lord if I'm taking insulin. Um, God can do miracles, and, and there are different ways that God has physically healed people, but you also need to make sure that if you're wanting to see, well, has God healed me? That you work closely with your doctor. Don't, don't just, I'm going to go off all my medication and, and trust the Lord. He can do miracles, and I've seen him do miracles to heal, to heal people. But at the same time, we, we thank God for medical advancement for our benefit. God has gifted people and researchers to, to help us. So um, don't, don't get off your medicines.
All right, you um, want to do rapid fire? Yeah. Because we've only got a couple more. All minutes. right, I'll touch two quick ones. Could you please recommend a study Bible? Three resources I love the NLT Application Study Bible, NLT Application Study Bible, Warren Wearsby's Study Bible. Warren Wearsby's now gone to be with the Lord, but great study Bible by Warren Wearsby. And then a website, Blue Letter Bible, Blue Letter Bible.org. I use it all the time. Look up the Greek, look up the Hebrew, all that good stuff, and good commentaries, blueletterbible.org. And then one more question, how do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? I love this question. You ask the Lord to be your savior. Ask Jesus into your heart, surrender your life to him. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's the best decision you can ever make um, just surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and believing on Him that He died for your sins and rose from the dead. And if you want to talk more or learn more about it, I'd love to talk with you and you can shoot me an email. Um, my email's on the website, so shoot me an email. I'd love to talk to you more about it. Uh, is God and Jesus the same? Yes, they are, uh, but they are also distinct from each other. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. And then the the... The Jews tried to stone him for the very reason where they said, you, a mere man, claim to be God. So he did claim to be God. Um, so is he God? Yes. He declared himself to be God. His followers believed that he was God. And the only way of salvation works if Jesus is God. However, he is still distinct in the Trinity. Yeah. One, one God, three distinct personalities. Um, somebody asked, do we have guardian angels? Uh, Jesus said in um, Matthew 18, 10, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, meaning children. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. So he seemed to indicate there in Matthew 18, 10, that, that children have specific angels assigned to them. I think, um, I don't think at one point you know, they leave you. So I think probably all of us do have guardian angels of some kind. One other quick one. Uh, can you tell us the difference, if any, between hell, Hades, Sheol, and the lake of fire? So Sheol is hell in the Hebrew. Hades is the Greek equivalent. Mm -hmm. um, and then the lake of fire is the eternal judgment. Revelation speaks about the lake of fire. So this current uh, earth, the current heaven and current hell are all going to be destroyed. The Bible tells us in Revelation, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth created. And then the lake of fire is the eternal hell, the eternal judgment. So. Um, does that yeah. suffice? Okay. Does your church perform weddings and funerals? Yes. Um, although there's limited, you know, right now with COVID, um, as far as the size of the weddings go, and we only perform um, heterosexual weddings. Why do I have to say that anymore? But that's what we do. We don't perform any same-sex weddings. Um, are you a Pentecostal church? Only in the sense that we do believe the gifts are still available today but we would be different from a Pentecostal church in the truest sense of the word where um, the um, gifts of the spirit are free flowing somewhat, but regulated in the church services. Um, we, we look at what Paul said at the Corinthian church. He said, if, if uh, um, everybody speaks in tongues and some come into your church who are, are not saved or don't understand, won't they think that you're out of your mind? So we think there's a place for it. We believe in the gifts, just not in the corporate setting. And then someone said, that they're new to our church, this is the last one, they're new to our church, um, don't know what denomination we belong to, Baptist, interdenominational, or Assembly of God. We, we're, we don't belong to a denomination, but we do belong to an affiliation of churches, the Calvary Chapel Association. Uh, Chuck Smith um, was my pastor until he died about, it's been about six years now, I guess, when, when Chuck died. Um, so we are part of the Calvary Chapel Association of churches that um, are really across the country, across the, the world, and it's been a, a great fellowship for us. Chuck's the one that always, um, emphasized and taught me, you teach straight through the Bible, go cover to cover. What other book do you read that you hop around chapter to chapter? Go cover to cover. And that's what we've done here. And so that's what we'll continue to do. Let me dive into a couple of the questions that have been submitted. Uh, why do people worship on Sunday instead of Saturday? Isn't Friday night to Saturday night? God's day to worship him. It is one of his commandments to worship him on the Sabbath. Isn't the Sabbath Friday night to Saturday night sundown? So technically the Sabbath is uh, Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. Um, God doesn't command us to worship him. He, he commands us to rest. And the reason why um, the church today, by and large, with the exception of Seventh-day Adventists, um, Protestant churches worship on Sunday 
is because it's consistent with the resurrection of Christ. We know that Christ rose the first day of the week. First day of the week is not Monday, it is Sunday. The first day of your work week might be Monday, uh, but the first day of the week on a calendar is Sunday. We know that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. He rose from the dead on a Sunday. And when you look at the book of Acts, you see the early church continued to meet on Sunday to commemorate the resurrection of Christ. And that just has never ceased. So even though the Sabbath still is technically Saturday, the day of worship uh, has been ongoing since the book of Acts. You see the pattern happening in the book of Acts where the early church continued to gather on Sunday in commemoration of the resurrection of Christ. So that's why we do that. Another quick question, why do we believe the Bible is complete and accurate when it was assembled by humans hundreds of years after Christ? Uh, well, okay, a couple of things. First of all, the compilation of the scriptures might have been pulled together a couple hundred years afterwards, but the eyewitness account was at the time of. And so nothing was lost in terms of the integrity of scripture just because which books and which manuscripts were decided a few hundred years after Christ. The, the manuscripts were, were written and recorded by eyewitnesses. Um, when you look at the Bible and you think about, you know, um, textual integrity and, you know, well, it was, it was arranged by humans, but, you, you know, it has to pass a test that is similar to other works of antiquity. Why do you believe in Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars? Uh, he recorded it over seven years and he wrote a volume each of the seven years. But how do we know that that's reliable? And yet it's taught in classrooms and people accept Jul Julius Caesar's eyewitness account of his own Gallic Wars as historical. But all of a sudden, because the Bible is written, then people uh, are, sus are suspicious about its integrity and reliability. But when you look at the Bible, the Bible was written over a period of about 1600 years by 40 different authors inspired by the Spirit um, in three different languages on three different continents. And yet all of it is uh, consistent and harmonious in terms of the unity of the message. 1,600 years, 40 authors, three continents, three languages. I mean, seriously, think about, you know, getting um, 40 writers together from the New York Times and telling them an event that happened over a period of like 48 hours and see how consistent that would be. So the fact that the Bible has withstood the test of antiquity and time with a consistent message, even though it was written over 1600 years, 40 authors, three continents, three languages, is a testimony to its inspiration. So um, there's always that question of, you know, human involvement. Um, but the Bible talks about how that men were carried along by the Holy Spirit, that they were inspired. Now, it wasn't this, um, you know, thing where they were under a trance and they were just, you know, writing. But God used their personalities and God used their intellect and God used their heart to bear witness to his ultimate message. And the whole theme of the Bible is consistent. It was Graham Scroge who said, if you cut the Bible anywhere, it bleeds because it's all about Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of God's Son on the cross. Old Testament to new, Jesus is revealed in the old as well as the new. He is somewhat veiled in the Old Testament, but revealed in the new, but it's all about Jesus and God's ultimate plan to redeem mankind. If you wanna. Amen. If you, uh, if you wanna go deeper into the study of the manuscripts and the compilation and uh, who wrote what and how it was compiled. It's a large book. I think they've edited it or trimmed it down, but Josh McDowell's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, yeah. such a good book and uh, a great apologist. And his son, Sean McDowell, has done a lot of great stuff as well. But Evidence That Demands a Verdict is a great read yeah. about that. Um, I'll take a practical question. It, it says, uh, this person writes, in the Bible, signs from God were more recognizable. How can we recognize or determine God's signs to us today. For example, and they give a hypothetical example, I want to move to another state, but my husband doesn't. I get a job offer in that other state. Is this the Lord paving our way for the move or is it my way of justifying the move? So basically to summarize that question, how can I still hear God's voice today? I mean, I don't know about you, but so many times in my life I've wondered, or I've just I've asked the Lord, could you just speak to me like audibly and clearly because I have important decisions to make and how can I still hear God's voice today can God still speak audibly? And if not, how can I 
clearly hear from him to make some of these different important decisions. Um, God spoke audibly in Scripture plenty of times in the Old Testament, just to name a few. Spoke to Moses at the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3. Spoke to Joshua in Joshua 1. Spoke to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. Uh, spoke to Samuel in 1 Samuel 13. Jesus spoke audibly to uh, Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9. So it's not that God still can't speak audibly to us today. I think he very well could, but we have to remember that God speaking audibly is always the exception, never the rule. I mean, you have to think God speaking audibly, all of those different instances I named, those five examples, that happened over a period of 4,000 years of human history. So it's easy for us to thumb through our Bible and see all the different times that God audibly spoke to believers and then wonder, what, God, why aren't you audibly speaking to me? But it was always the exception in Scripture, and it's never the rule. But I don't uh, discount that um, God may choose to still audibly speak, but I've never audibly heard God speak. Um, and so I think it's more of the exception and not the rule. Um, so with this question about how can I still clearly hear God speak, well, I can't tell you what to do, but here are some questions that I think might be beneficial for you to ask yourself when making any important decision in life. The first question is, is this within the bounds of Scripture? Does, will this decision contradict what Scripture tells me to do? Is this decision being made within the boundaries of Scripture? Number two, have you prayed about your decision? So many times I've worried and have become so anxious about decisions in my life, and it was usually my mom growing up who always would challenge me, have you prayed about it? And it was always so annoying. I was like, no, mom, I haven't prayed about it. But it's so true. Ha have you prayed about this decision? Have you uh, maybe prayed with your, your husband or your wife and just prayed together about this decision? Uh, James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. He, he gives generously to all without finding fault. So ask the Lord for wisdom. Lord, just give me wisdom about this decision. Uh, third, will this decision bring God glory? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. So am I making this decision? Will this decision bring God ultimate glory? Um, question number four, you, ask, you have to ask yourself, are you overemphasizing a coincidence? You know, sometimes we see what we want to see out there. Um, and so, you know, scripture says God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And sometimes I overemphasize a coincidence in my life. Um, and then finally, have you sought counsel from other people? Proverbs 15, 22 says plans fall for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Um, so make a decision and trust God. If you pass it through the grid of God's word, seek some good godly counsel, make a decision and trust that God is in control. Um, a great book is The Four Wills of God by Emerson Egrich. Emerson Egrich was here and did a uh, love and respect conference and he wrote a book called The Four Wills of God. And uh, it's a great, great book just to better understand practically how can I make decisions that honor the Lord and uh, how can I clearly hear from the Lord. So that's a good book by Emerson Egrich. Uh, here's a question that's come in. Why did Jesus choose 12 disciples? And then a question that kind of correlates with it. What is your opinion on the Chosen series? Um, who's, who's heard of the Chosen series? It's a, okay, awesome. I highly recommend it. Um, if you don't know about it, look it up. Um, it's probably on YouTube, but the DVDs are out. Um, but the Chosen series is, I think, very accurate. I haven't seen anything heretical with it. And it's just the life of Jesus in his early ministry days. And I think the creator, Dallas Jenkins, is doing a great job. Season two is in the making. It's, it's going to be coming soon. But um, if you don't know about it, you need to look up The Chosen. And it's just all about Jesus with his disciples and his early ministry days here on earth. Um, so I, we highly recommend it. I love it. And then why did Jesus choose 12 disciples? It doesn't really say, but um, we know in that culture, that ancient time, um, you know, Jesus was known as a teacher. People call him teacher or rabbi in the scriptures, and he was. He was a teacher, and teachers in that time would have pupils or students or followers or disciples. Um, he, would, he would teach them, and so he had a following of, of 12. John the Baptist actually had disciples as well. Um, why did Jesus choose 12? We don't really know. Maybe it's uh, symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, 12 is, is a symbolic number, but um, be that as it may, Jesus chooses 12 disciples because he's a teacher. Um, and he's the best teacher of all. And so right now we're all considered disciples as followers of Christ, but great question. And yeah, check out The Chosen. It's a great series. Um, we, you know, there are a lot of people in our church and those who are 
um, texting in, I suppose, too, um, with Catholic backgrounds. And um, we get a lot of questions about Catholicism. Um, and this one person said, I was raised Catholic, left the Catholic Church a few years ago after a close friend introduced me to Cornerstone. By doing so, have I thrown away, uh, by doing so, have I thrown away all of the sacraments I have received, baptism, communion, confirmation? Do I need to be baptized again as a part of a non-denominational Christian church? Um, others asked, are Catholics considered Christians slash are they saved? Um, we, we get many questions about um, Catholicism. And, um, you know, I, I want to be careful because, um, you know, there are, there are Catholics who are born again believers, I'm convinced. Um, there are Methodists who are born again believers. There are Baptists who are born again believers. And then there are some within each of those uh, circles or denominations that, that are not and think they are. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, of course, it's about do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Um, heresy falls into two camps. One type of heresy is the denial uh, and the, uh, of the deity and the um, personal lordship of Jesus Christ. Another camp of heresy is the addition of any requirement for salvation other than faith in the finished work of Christ's death on the cross. Catholics um, are okay with number one, as far as like, you know, they, they accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died on a cross for our sins. The problem is with number two, the addition of requirements um, in terms of the necessity for salvation. And, and then you get into penance and, and, you, and you get into uh, works and you get into different things that then um, corrupt the simplicity of the message, which is salvation is through faith alone and Christ alone. And the moment that you start to add anything to that, um, you've just corrupted the, the message and of, of the cross, and it basically is heresy. But you could say that about a lot of things, too. You know, people who say, um, you know, it's, it's, it's baptism and believing in Jesus. Well, that corrupts it too. Or, if it, or it's speaking in tongues and believing in Jesus. Well, that, that corrupts it too. So anything you add to the simplicity of it's faith alone in Christ alone, you've just made it a works-oriented thing. And so um, in that way, uh, the Roman Catholic Church is, is, um, has, has a problem. And, um, and yet there are people who don't necessarily understand um, some of the ins and outs of the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, who, who love Jesus and um, have trusted him as Lord and Savior. So, um, you know, it's, it's difficult for us. We can, we can look at certain doctrines and dogmas and say, well, this is not biblical and that's not biblical. Um, and, and, and yet people who aren't necessarily familiar with their own doctrine and doctrine. I mean, I've had, I've talked about, for example, transubstantiation, which is the belief that um, that when Roman Catholics believe when you take the wafer and drink of the wine that it actually, the, it molecularly changes within your system and you actually ingest the body and blood of Jesus. And I've had Catholics email me and say, we do not believe that. And I'm like, oh, I got to point to your own catechism then because it says that. And so there are people who, who don't understand their own dogma, but yet they just love Jesus. And so you know, it's difficult to answer those kind of questions because then you start making um, judgments sometimes based on heart issues. And I know people who are very dogmatic on, on both sides, and, and yet it's, uh, it's something that we have to, you know, um, recognize that there, there's, um, there's some challenging doctrines and dogmas in a lot of circles. Um, at the end of the day, it's about a personal relationship with Jesus, and you can't add to that or improve upon it. Um, there was another question. Um, um, does this mean that we have to be baptized to enter heaven? No, you, and, and it's in response to a question Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, that is not a question about water baptism. When Jesus said, unless you are born of water and the spirit, he's talking about two types of birth. Being born of water is physical birth. It's when a child is born and the mother's water breaks. It's being born physically and then being born spiritually, which is to say that one 
confesses sin, has a personal relationship with Jesus, trusts Him as Lord and Savior. So that verse is not about water baptism. That verse is about physical birth and spiritual birth. If you're only born once, you will die twice. But if you are born twice, you die once. Does everybody follow that? If you are born uh, once, just physical birth, but you don't experience a spiritual birth, then you will die physically and you will die spiritually. You will be punished eternally. There's two types of death involved there. But if one is, is uh, born twice, that is you're born physically and then you're born again, you have a personal relationship with Jesus, then you might die physically, but you will pass from death to life and you will always be with the Lord forever and ever. Guys? I'll take a question and um, I want to you know, answer this question sensitively, but also biblically. Uh, the question is, please define social justice. How are we to respond to current culture's expectation? Please define social justice. Um, Especially the churches, you know, of late, the church's obsession yeah. with social justice. It's become very trendy, I think, to hop on the train of social justice. And, and it's equated with how the Bible refers to justice. There are a lot of scripture verses about justice and the Lord is a God of justice. Um, social justice is not biblical justice. Social justice is not biblical justice. Um, I'm going to refer you to a great podcast called uh, Relatable. It's by Ali B. Stuckey. Great podcast. She goes deeper into this, eloquently explains it, um, and, and she makes some very valid points. Um, justice is getting what you deserve uh, without favor. Social justice is getting what you don't deserve because you are favored. There's a big difference. Um, justice is blind. Social justice is not blind. Um, let's say a man robs a store, a, a store and uh, Man robs a store, he's caught. Uh, justice would ask, is he guilty? Would he go before, he or she go before a court of justice? Is, she or, is he or she guilty? Uh, if yes, then they would be appropriate, appropriately punished. Um, social justice does not ask only, is he or she guilty? But it asks a uh, litany of other questions. What about their economic status? Uh, what about their upbringing? What kind of childhood do they have? What kind of, uh, eth what it, what's their ethnicity? Um, and so it doesn't always just ask, it, is he or she guilty of the crime? And then, yes, if not, if yes, then they must be appropriately punished. Uh, justice demands that everyone be equal under the law. Social justice demands that some be favored and others not, depending on their status, about who, who they are. Maybe their upbringing, maybe their economic status, poor or rich. This is, bibli biblical justice is much different than social justice. Biblically, this is what uh, the Bible says about justice. Do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. Here's one in Leviticus. Don't pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great. But judge your neighbor justly. Moses in Deuteronomy, he said, follow justice and justice alone. And the New Testament declares in the book of Romans, God shows no partiality. Now this doesn't mean that we still can't have compassion. God is a God of compassion. We should be his children and be children of compassion to other people. But just because we're compassionate doesn't mean we have to pervert justice or redefine what biblical justice is. And I believe that the social justice movement is creeping in and twisting biblical justice. Biblical justice, and, and this is what Ali B. Stuckey says, just pulled a quote. However, justice in and of itself is compassionate first to the victims of crime and to their loved ones, and second to the criminal. How can you become a better human being if you don't first recognize that you've done something wrong? So I think that we can still hold compassion and justice. They're not contradictory, but they go hand in hand, uh, hand in glove. And so we should be people of compassion, people who love other people, people who um, treat one another with the love of Jesus Christ that we've first been shown, but at the same time uphold a biblical definition of what justice truly is. Before Tyler goes um, with a question, I want to piggyback on that because social justice also has the root word, you know, social in it. And we've been getting questions about socialism. And, um, you know, the question is um, sometimes phrased like, wasn't Jesus a socialist? Um, like, like he was Bernie Sanders in a toga. No. <laughs> um, 
let me, let me just clarify some things, because this is also a very trendy thing, like socialism and, you know, making sure that everybody is equally served and, um, you know, the, and the government um, basically then has a lot more control over the equal distribution of wealth. And there's various aspects of socialism, communism, Marxism, okay? Um, first of all, the Bible does say in Acts 2.45 that the early church sold their possessions and distributed to anyone in need. And it sounds like a very, you know, socialist society there, this communal way of taking your possession, selling it, and then distributing it to everybody in need. But you have to always understand context, because a text out of context is, uh, is heresy. And so you have to know what's the text in the context. Here's the text in the context. When the early church, and the early church, for the first 10 years, when you look at the book of Acts, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ were all Jews, all right? There wasn't a Gentile who got saved until Acts chapter 10. So for the first 10 years, the early church was comprised of believers in Jesus, in Yeshua, who were Jews. Let me tell you what happened, and still happens today, in some circles of Judaism. Uh, but back in those days in particular, when Jews trusted Jesus and believed he was Mashiach, was Messiah, they were um, shunned by the rest of society. And they would have funerals for you. I know, I know a Jewish family in Israel today. The husband's a believer, the wife is not. And when asked, you know, why don't you believe in Jesus? Um, she said, because my family would disown me, and I'm going to wait till my parents basically die so that I can graciously, you know, um, be more vocal about, about coming to faith in Christ. Okay, so um, that, that's what her husband has, has uh, told me. So there's this pressure. If, if you accept Christ, you're going to be shunned and disowned. So the early church, when Jews accepted Christ, nobody bought any from their shops. Um, families disowned them. They became destitute, they became poor. As a matter of survival, the early Jews of the early church pooled their resources and distributed among themselves in order to survive because they had been completely shunned and, and as outcasts of society. That was a matter of survival. It was not intended to be a practice or a principle or a pattern. It was a unique time as a matter of survival. People look at Acts 2.45 and think, well, we should be more socialistic and distribute all our wealth. No, 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 that's out of context. We also need to understand that hard work is what is honored in the Bible. Paul would write in 1 Timothy 5.8 that anyone who does not provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. It talks about hard work. And in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10, it says, Paul says, a man who does not work shall not eat. Okay, so, we have to look out for the poor. The, the church has a responsibility to look out for the poor and the needy, and Proverbs talks about rewards for, for looking out for the poor and needy. We have a, a benevolent fund, and we've, we've given away hundreds of thousands of dollars to the poor and to the needy in our own community. And we've done these food drives and outreaches because we do have a privilege and a responsibility to look out for those who are less privileged and those um, who need help. Um, but that's very different from a socialist kind of a society. So again, it, you know, social justice is, is very trendy. And the, other, the problem with social justice too can be that it becomes a gospel of itself and that people uh, begin to feel like that they are um, assuaging their own personal guilt because they're doing good and wonderful and noble things. Um, it, it's called moralistic, um, uh, I'm going to get the, I'm gonna, moralistic, um, moralistic theistic deism. It's, it's the idea of people who feel like they're doing a service to God because they're engaged in all these wonderful social justice um, outreaches. Look out for the poor, look out for the needy, do wonderful things, but it should never supplant, it should never replace the gospel, and unfortunately, some people have made it a gospel of, of their own. We need to look out for the poor and needy without compromising the truth of the gospel and without making social justice more central than the gospel itself. Okay, Tyler. Let's jump into end times. <laughs> Take it right to the end because we're almost out of time anyway with all that. 
So one question says there, there have been several peace deals that have been made with Israel this year and, and last year. Uh, were these peace deals expected prophetically and how do they relate to the work of the Antichrist? Um, yes, there have been several peace deals that have been happening now. Um, the Antichrist really has nothing to do with this part. Um, this is all God's doing. And a chapter we all need to be reading right now is Ezekiel 38 and 39 because I think it is um, the stage is being set. And Ezekiel 37 is about the valley of the dry bones that Ezekiel sees and Israel becoming a nation again. That's already happened. That's been fulfilled. That was fulfilled 70 years ago. The next chapter is this prophecy about an invading nation that comes against Israel, but that God um, basically just destroys them with um, cataclysmic events and by the wrath of, of his fury. Um, and there's, there's three verses that you can take note of, Ezekiel 38, 14, uh, 38, 16, and 38, 18. In Ezekiel 38, 14, it talks about God is telling this to Ezekiel, therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, this is what the sovereign Lord says, in that day when my people Israel are living in safety or peace, will you not take notice of it? Um, all these peace deals that are happening with Israel right now, um, under the Trump administration, I think the stage is being set for Ezekiel 38 to be fulfilled sometime soon, because this had to happen in order for peace. What is, people have been speculating, what is that peace that Israel's living in? Well, my, my personal thought is that it's these peace deals that are happening with the nation of Israel, and they're going to be living in peace. Verse 16 Ezekiel 38 says, you will advance, this is talking about this Gog, you will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, O Gog, I will bring you against my land, Israel, so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their very eyes. So God is doing this. God's bringing them against his people. It's going to happen. And in verse 18, it talks about when Gog... Whoever Gog may be, and there's speculation that is it is this Russia, because it talks about the distant north. When Gog attacks Israel, God will reveal his wrath and judgment on Gog. And the nations, the end of Ezekiel 38 is awesome, because the nations will know that God is the Lord, all caps. All the nations will revere and, and see that the Lord is God. And scholars debate on, is, will this happen in... Um, you know, in the lifetime before the rapture, will this happen after the rapture? We don't really know. There's, there's debates on that. But I do think it is no coincidence that all these peace deals are happening right now concerning the nation of Israel. Because Israel is the number one nation that's going to be, that's, that's the nation that's all about the end times, is Israel. And so I do think it is somewhat prophetic, and I think the stage is being set. Um, so keep your eye on, on Israel, the news, and Ezekiel 38. All right, we have to do rapid fire because the time has already escaped us. So you guys want to look at any of these questions and quick answers? Sure. Um, C1, what is your view about confession and why? Uh, the concept of confession to a priest, we just don't see it in Scripture. You know, we're a Bible teaching church. The Bible's our handbook. Um, I don't see confession to a priest taught in Scripture. Um, thank the Lord. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Lord, then He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we have a direct line to the Lord. When, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, the temple curtain split in two so that now man has direct access to God. You don't have to go to the Pope or a priest or Pastor Gary. Thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. You can just go straight. <laughs> me, me too. I don't want to hear your business. Just go straight to the Lord. Uh, that's why Paul said there is one mediator, one mediator between a holy God and sinful man, the man Christ Jesus. And so Jesus is our lifeline to the Father. Is baptism a requirement to receive the salvation of Christ? No, again, you, you don't need to add anything. You should be baptized because it, it identifies you with the finished work of Christ, but it's not a requirement for salvation. You can't add anything to, again, it's faith alone and Christ alone. A lot of questions about, are there any biblical insight on whether or not aliens exist? Oh, that's not a quick answer. It is right here. No, okay. um, but the Bible does talk about people from an unseen realm called the spiritual world. Read Genesis chapter 6, and it's called demons. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> J 
Should I read my Bible? Yes. A lot of questions about the Holy Spirit. A great book is by Chuck Smith. It's called uh, Living Waters, yeah. The Power of the Holy Spirit in Your Life. Read that book. Chuck Smith, Living Waters. Also, A.W. Tozer wrote a great book called How to Be Filled with the Holy Spirit. Two great books talking about the Holy Spirit. Is there any sin that God will not forgive? No. And in fact, I got a very precious uh, question from somebody. I can't find the question right now, but they, they basically asked um, about how Jesus said it's better to tie a millstone around your neck and be thrown into the sea than to ever lead a little one astray. And then um, the next part of it was, can a woman be forgiven for abortion? And yes, Jesus died for all sins, for all people. There's forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And aren't we glad that he died on a cross to forgive us from all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, they just texted me that we have now uh, exceeded 1,000 questions, and obviously we, um, we got to 998, so uh, we did pretty good. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you for your questions. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, Lord, even though we couldn't get to um, most of these questions, we just thank you, Lord, that our eyes are fixed on you, the author and finisher of our faith. We look to you, Lord, especially in these days when there's so much confusion and what is true and what is not. And we just lean on you, Lord, and look to your word, and we thank you that you love us and that you've given us your word, that we might have truth, Lord, in a very relative world. Bless this new year, we pray. Go before us. Thank you for your goodness and your grace in our lives and for our church. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen.